Psychology is a massive field and it covers every little nook and cranny of the human experience. So it shouldn't be surprising that over the years, it has uncovered some pretty bizarre things about our minds and the way they relate to the world around us. These are five facts about psychology that might make you rethink your perspective on reality. Light is made up of tiny little electromagnetic waves, and these waves are a lot like ocean waves. Some are very long and stretched out, and some are very tightly scrunched together. And the term for this is wavelength. Long stretched out waves have a long wavelength. Tiny scrunched together light waves have a short wavelength. And it turns out this is what determines color. We perceive long wavelengths as colors like red and orange. We perceive the very tiny wavelengths as colors like blue and purple. But that color does not exist outside our brains. In the real world, light waves don't have color. They just have length. They're just colorless electromagnetic ripples sailing through the universe. However, that length, that wavelength, holds incredibly important information for us. The wavelength of light bouncing off a berry can tell us the difference between one that is poisonous and one that's edible. The range of wavelengths that are seeping through the underbrush can tell us if there's a predator waiting in that underbrush. So the brain is faced with an interesting problem. How does it communicate the important difference between 600 nanometer wavelength light and 700 nanometer wavelength light? It would need some kind of metaphor, some kind of easy to understand understand qualitative symbolic representation of wavelength. So our visual cortex creates the illusion of color to pass this information along to our conscious brains. But that doesn't change the fact that if you were somehow able to step in front of your eyes, you would see a colorless world full of electromagnetic waves bouncing off each other. Your brain has two hemispheres that are connected kind of like this. And each half of your brain controls one half of your body. So for example, one hemisphere controls your left hand, the other hemisphere controls your right hand. The most important difference between these two halves arguably has to do with speech. The left half of your brain is where language processing and language production is centered. So the left half of the brain can speak and it can understand speech. The right half of the brain cannot. It's effectively completely mute. It still has thoughts, but it has to ask the left hemisphere very nicely for help in verbalizing those thoughts. This usually isn't a problem because the two hemispheres coordinate and communicate very closely by sending information back and forth across little bundles of fibers that connect the two halves. In some patients with epilepsy, these bundles are severed to help reduce the severity of their seizures. But in these cases, both hemispheres are now floating completely independent of one another, unable to chat back and forth and compare notes. And we can very carefully set up situations where we feed each half of the brain conflicting pieces of information. We can convince the left half of the brain, for example, that it sees a hammer in front of its face. And we can at the same time convince the right half of the brain that it sees a saw. When we ask the subject, what do you see in front of your eyes? What we're effectively doing is asking the left half of their brain. That's the half that can talk and communicate. Whenever I chat with you or you talk to somebody else, we're really talking left brain to left brain. So in this situation, how is that subject going to answer? Well, their left speaking half of the brain thinks it saw a hammer. So they're going to tell you, I saw a hammer. What did you see? It's not a hammer. But what happens if you give that right non-speaking half of the brain a pencil and you ask that hand that it controls to draw what it saw? Well, in this case, the subject will draw a saw. That's nice. What's that? Saw. Yeah. What did you see? Hammer. What'd you draw that for? I don't know. 
And it's not so much that the subject can't explain why they drew a saw. It's that the left hemisphere that you have verbal access to can't explain why they drew it. The right half of the brain may be totally aware of why they did it, but it just cannot get those words from inside their skull out to you. And there are other versions of this experiment that go even further. We can ask the subject to reach out with one hand and grab the object they saw from a table in front of them. And sometimes the other hand will actually grab the first hand and correct it, try to bring it over to the object that it thinks it perceived. And the two brains will actually fight it out back and forth through the hemispheres that they respectively control. And it's worth noting, this is not unique to epilepsy patients. This is true of the way your brain works as well. You actually have two completely independent, totally functional minds that are capable of having different views and opinions and perspectives on reality. The reason you don't ever notice this is because those two halves of your brain are so easily able to communicate and cooperate through those little bundles of fiber that run information back and forth. In the aftermath of World War II, psychologists were left to grapple with questions about humanity's potential for evil. How could we be capable of committing atrocities like the ones that Allied troops were finding as they liberated concentration camps across Europe? A psychologist named Stanley Milgram thought that it boiled down to our susceptibility to commands from strong authority figures. He recruited subjects at random and told them they'd be taking part in a study on learning. He would pair them up, and every time the learner got a question wrong, the teacher was supposed to give them an electric shock. And the intensity of that shock went up pretty dramatically every time an answer was incorrect. What they didn't know was that the person being shocked was an actor, and the shocks were fake. Nobody was actually in any kind of danger. But as the teacher, the real subject, was upping the intensity of the shocks, the actor was screaming out in agony. You're gonna get a shock, 180 volts. Oh. I can't stand the pain. And actually at one point, the actor would start saying, hey, I've got a heart condition, stop, you gotta let me out of here. And eventually, disturbingly, that person just completely fell silent and stopped responding. 375 volts. I think something's happened to that fellow in there. I don't get no answer. He was hollering with less voltage. Can't you check in and see if he's all right, please? This implied that they'd either passed out or died. When they failed to respond to questions, the teacher was told that that counted as an incorrect answer to shock him again and boost the voltage. 65% of subjects carried this out to the very end of the experiment. Now they were clearly uncomfortable, they were protesting, but as long as the researcher in a white lab coat with a clipboard, very official, very authoritative kind of looking, said, you know what, the experiment must continue, please continue. They just kind of put their head down and kept going. The experiment requires you continue, teacher, please continue. I mean, who's gonna take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? And I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one, slow. Walk, dance, truck, music. They appeared to be more uncomfortable with the idea of challenging an authority figure in the room than they were with killing a complete stranger. So why do they do this? If they refused, it wasn't like they were going to lose their jobs. It wasn't like they were going to go to jail. They were just randomly recruited subjects in a study. There was really no penalty. It seems that humans are just hardwired fundamentally to follow orders from strong authority figures. Now take this effect and insert it into a real world circumstance, especially a military situation where the penalty for refusal is very real. It can be social ridicule, it can be jail time, it can be execution. None of us think we behave this way. But study after study suggests that's just not true. It seems that most of us are entirely willing to kill a complete stranger given the correct circumstance, whether we want to believe that or not. 
this is easily the most controversial item on this list. Daryl Bim is a psychology professor at Cornell University, and he's been searching for something called precognition, which is effectively the ability for people to tell and perceive the future. His experiments are based off of a variation of something called the mere exposure effect. This is the well-established effect that given repeated exposures to a stimulus, like an image, for example, a person will become accustomed to that image and their preferences for that image will change accordingly. For example, if you look at a particularly violent or aversive image over and over and over, you might ultimately become desensitized to it and it won't have that same visceral aversive reaction that it did when you first saw it. When presented with two similarly disturbing images, you might prefer to look at the more familiar one because it's a little less disturbing now that you become used to it. On the other hand, images that are more pleasing might become boring with repeated exposure. In this case, we'd see the opposite effect. Given the choice, you might choose to look at the more novel, unfamiliar, pleasing image because it's newer and more reinforcing. BIM's research tests a reversal of this effect. He asked subjects to choose between the two images first, and then he randomly picks one to repeatedly expose the subject to. Now, according to how we understand reality, this should have no impact on the subject's initial choice. That would be the future affecting the past. Impossible. But this is where it gets weird. Bim claims to have found evidence that exactly that is occurring. These repeated exposures somehow go back in time and impact the initial choice. Subjects are more likely to choose aversive images that they will be exposed to repeatedly in the future, and they're more likely to choose pleasing images that they will not be exposed to repeatedly in the future. Now, the effect is small, something like 2% beyond what we'd expect from chance, but it is very statistically significant. And he's been able to replicate this result several times. So what's going on here? We have two possible ways to interpret this. Either precognition is a thing and our understanding of everything from psychology to physics to philosophy has been wrong for millennia. Or this is a statistical fluke. Now, the statistics we use in research are not perfect. And statistical flukes do regularly occur. Now, we expect somewhere between 1% and 5% of results to fall into this category. That said, it remains a fascinating topic in the literature. I love reading papers along these lines. And it's an important example of the scientific community being open-minded enough to consider any hypothesis, as long as it has well-documented evidence supporting it. If there's one psychologist that I'm just a fan of, like a complete active adoring fan, it is Elizabeth Loftus. She does research on memory, specifically how easy it is to plant false memories or manipulate actual existing memories. And she doesn't do this through some kind of nefarious CIA interrogation technique. It's super subtle and it's very easy to do. Oftentimes she'll start with just a small suggestion and it can be as, as simple as, asking a question with slightly different wording. So you can ask one group, hey, did you see a guy with a green hat? And you can ask the other group, did you see the guy with a green hat? Now you can say no to either question, right? She's not forcing you to think there's a guy with a green hat, but when you phrase it as, did you see the guy? It implies that there was a guy with a green hat. These people are more likely to go, you know what? Yeah, I think it did see a guy with a green hat. And then once she plants that seed, she lets you tend to the garden. She lets you grow and fill out all the details. So she'll go, okay, well, you know, tell me about that guy with green hat. Was he wearing a shirt? What kind of shirt was it? You know, did he have facial hair? Was he tall? Was he short? Once the person's convinced that there was a guy with a green hat, they'll just run with it. They go, well, you know, he must have been wearing a shirt. So then, okay, yeah, I can picture a long sleeve shirt. They're imagining stuff but it is slowly being encoded as an actual memory. And you can come back minutes, hours, days, years later, and this memory, false planted memory, will feel just as real 
as every other memory you ever had. Christmas when you were a kid, your first kiss, your high school graduation. It is equal to all of those actual memories. Now, every other item on this list has talked about the reality you experience presently, right now in the nanosecond that you're conscious. But when you think about the larger iceberg that we think of as the reality we live in, it's mostly memory. Almost everything you know about the world around you, your favorite song, your favorite food, the people you love, they probably aren't in the room with you right now. All of those incredibly meaningful chunks of you, your personality, your human experience, in this second, they only live in your memory. And what Elizabeth Loftus' research has shown us is that your memory is not a reliable thing. It is as easily altered and manipulated as your imagination. I hope you found that informative. If you'd like to hear more about the weirder aspects of psychology and consciousness and behavior, then subscribe. Uh, and I will be putting out more videos along these lines in the future. Thanks for watching and have an excellent rest of your day.